Hi there everybody. I've got a an extra large cup of coffee today because this is lockdown lectures. Lecture 4A again. I did it yesterday and then I, <laughs> I erased it by mistake. So I'm doing it again. I think it's had some improvements in the... <laughs> Doing a, going the second time round, but I do feel <laughs> aggrieved at having to do this one twice for some reason. Um, why I'm doing this is is it's largely selfish because I'm wanting to to rethink through these these issues, uh, redo some of the research I did ten years ago, uh, find out new stuff, and and think through this whole issue of Jesus and Africa, the 2,000 years of, of Christianity on the continent of Africa. It's, there's a lot hidden there that I think can be of high value for us in Africa as we make our decisions, as we make our choices, as we make our compromises. Um, as we look at our new context and think of how how we could build on the good things and maybe uh, understand some of the dangers and pitfalls that we might find in in being Christians ourselves on the continent of Africa. So now we're going to look at at the motivations and the insights of the what's called the the uh, colonial era of mission to Africa largely from the West but let's think there's some things I'd, I'd, I'd like us to think about before we launch into this outsiders have typically been on the lookout for what they can take from Africa right and and missionaries have are often rightfully uh, accused of being implicated in in this colonial era piracy but but is there more to that are there ways in which western missionaries might have brought something to a value to africa but with good intentions i don't <laughs> that question mustn't be answered too glibly or too quickly uh but it needs to be at least parked on the side of our consciousness and and uh, Laman Sané, I think, is is one of the best advocates of of that approach or that understanding of um, the colonial era of mission. And looking at the roots of the modern missionary mo movement, we need to look at some of the early theorists. And I'd like to start with a twentieth century uh, thinker, David Bosch who said that the entire modern missionary enterprise is a child of the Enlightenment. I think he was right. You know, we are all deeply influenced by our culture and uh, sometimes more uh, insidiously than we, might, uh, than we might admit to or realize. Now, for those Enlightenment missionaries, they were, they were filled with the spirit of the age, really. <laughs> Uh, they they had developed this strong distaste for a state control of the church, uh, which I think I relate to. I don't know about you. Uh, mission to Africa, to in the rest of the world, was based on on renewals and awakenings, this uh, large, widespread excitement and uh, refinding of the the core message of Christianity. Human action was central. They, the, these guys had pragmatic op optimism. They were men and women who felt that if there was a problem, they could solve it. William Carey said, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. <laughs> it, it epitomizes that, that uh, way of seeing life. They, as far as can be made out, they were motivated by love for Jesus and love for people. They were very individualistic and they didn't understand perhaps people in culture or people in society. Uh, they uh, had to learn many lessons along those lines. Um, 
and they cheerfully assumed that Western culture was superior to all other cultures in the world, and that Western nations were chosen, somehow chosen. It, it took the First and Second World War to, to break that, that, uh, that false notion. Um, they clashed with colonialism at first. They clashed very heavily and, and then gradually accommodated with colonialism. They established a, a modus vivendi with the colonialists, some better and some worse. But we'll look into that as we go along. They many of the missionaries in this era were, were driven by a sense of urgency because Jesus was just about to come back and there was the spirit of of volunteerism you you didn't become a missionary because you were de designated to become a missionary you were a missionary because you volunteered to do it and there was a strong spirit of of volunteerism hi there Barbara um, Hope you had a good walk. It looked lovely this morning. Barbara from George. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't make these arbitrary comments on who's watching. Um, but let's look at, at two thinkers. And I'd like to switch to slides now. Um, two theorists who impacted the, the practice of, of mission in Africa by the colonial... Uh, missionaries more than than anyone else uh Zinzendorf and Carey let me try and get them into to better focus and get rid of that there we go Zinzendorf and Carey um they strongly influenced every missionary to Africa during the Enlightenment or modern period of missions and their insights were are still important to us today. Now we start off with Zinzendorf and the uh, community with which he was closely associated, the Herrnhuter Brudergemeine, known elsewhere as the Moravians. Um, they were Czech exiles from Roman Catholic persecution it was estimated that 95% of the population of that area of Bohemia um, became Protestant. And that was before, before Martin Luther and, and his protests. And, but they were savagely suppressed and people um, had to flee for their lives or go underground. Now, a group of 300, a, a small group of of these refugees um, met up with the fabulously wealthy uh, Count Zinzendorf. Now Zinzendorf had been born in 1700 and had a, a, a devastating, what's, what's the word, shocking, uh, world-changing con conversion experience to faith in Jesus and, and lived his life with a commitment to the poor. And he, he gave these 300 exiles a plot of land, a, a place to found a village called Herrnhut. And uh, things didn't go well at first. There was lots of fighting and infighting and discord. And then there was this uh, one remarkable season of prayer and outpouring of the Holy Spirit and and they were transformed into a very united, very prayerful uh, group of people who developed a sense of, of mission calling to the rest of the world. This was before this was, you know, this wasn't characteristic of Protestantism as a, as a whole. They were the, the thought leaders. And Zinzendorf was their ambassador at large. He, of course, he had large resources. He was very wealthy, so he could travel when and where he wanted to, and hobnob with the, the great and famous. Um, they sent, though, they sent a disproportionate number of missionaries. They punched way above their weight in an era where nobody was doing anything much. Uh, 1732, they, uh, Dober and Nitschmann were sent to the Caribbean. 1737, George Schmidt came to South Africa. 
1740, Christian Rauch uh, started uh, the Mahican mission to New York. I thought it was Mohican. I corrected it. It was actually Mahican. Um, they, had, they were missionaries sent to India and to uh, Greenland and to all over. These were uh, astonishingly motivated missionary people. Now, spot the fingerprint. I'm going to focus on, on the Moravians in South Africa again here. Look at the, look at the fingerprint of Herrenhut. Here's Genadendal. That was Babian's Kloof. Here's Wuppertal. Sadly burnt, burnt down uh, last year, remember? Um, and in the process of rebuilding. Here's Elam, another Moravian mission station. They feature um, a neat self-sustained village uh, where people looked after each other and where the, the church was, was central to everything. And let's switch to George Schmidt, who came to South Africa. He was a Moravian field operative and very characteristic of the of the way, of the sort of person who became a, a Moravian missionary and the sort of way in which he did mission. He was a peasant boy. He uh, was, education wouldn't have been an option for him. Um, but he did put his faith in Christ as a young man and eventually joined Herrenhut and became one of their... Um, leading evangelists in in the area he in fact he spent six years in prison in bohemia for preaching to house groups like he wasn't preaching on the street he was just uh, sharing the gospel in with underground groups and he was busted by the church authorities and spent six years in prison that's extreme in 1736 a couple of dutch clergymen uh uh, somehow came to know about this guy and see and it seemed to them they weren't Moravians themselves but it seemed to to them that this uh, man was a good bet to be a missionary to the the Khoi in the Cape province and uh, in 1738 he f founded the Genadendal community at Bavianskloof Bavian's Kloof means baboon's scourge. I don't think it was because of the boon, baboons. I think this was a, um, a, a slur, a colonial um, uh, slur against the presence of the Khoi community there. Um, anyway, he changed the name to Genadendal, and that's what it is today. 1744, though, in, back in the Netherlands, amongst the Dutch uh, clergy who had uh, been responsible for recruiting him as a missionary, they began to hear that he was horror of horrors, <laughs> baptizing new converts, and he wasn't a proper <laughs> clergyman. So they, they basically recalled him. He, he expected to come back to South Africa, but he never did. And the, it's interesting that that there was this this uh, this uh, drive to control the least details of the of what happened in the the new amongst the newly formed Christian communities in the colonies uh, on the part of the Christian uh, church in home countries. It's one of the um, we'll we'll touch on this quite often, this, this distrust of new um, forms of the church on the part of the, the old forms, older forms of the church. So he went back to Bohemia and, and spent the rest of his life <laughs> as an evangelist, con constantly putting himself in, the, in harm's way in Bohemia. Um, very interesting man and well worth a deeper study than I've been able to give to him. Now, he epitomized the Moravian way of mission. <clears throat> prayerful, very <laughs> fanatically prayerful. The Moravians are famous for having their 100-year uh, prayer meeting, where someone was praying every hour of day and night, every day of the week, 
for a hundred years without ceasing for the nations of the world and for the kingdom of God. Uh, they believed in missionary life commitment. You got on the boat and you didn't expect to come back. You weren't expecting to come back. They were always people orientated with a particular focus on the marginalized. Uh, they were self-supporting and locally based. And their idea was to, to produce, to establish a viable village, to reproduce the Harrenhut community where, where food production and, and uh, education and Christianity all went hand in hand and, and it was a, a safe haven for, for the harassed. Uh, they did use Dutch. Uh, they were pragmatic linguists, not intellectual scholars. Um, and they had an emotional and very personal presentation of the gospel, um, which was very well received. And they taught technical skills because they were technical people. They were cobblers. They were masons. They were uh, bricklayers. They were uh, people with skills of hand and they they taught it to people and and really th their villages you could say that there was a coherence between gospel and culture in what they did okay that is uh I'll leave the slides for a bit uh, that is zinzendorf and schmidt theorist and and missionary. I would now I'd like to look at someone who was both theorist and missionary in one person, uh, William Carey. He started off also as a as a poor man. With uh, he was a cobbler, a part time teacher. Um, he wrote a very interesting book, a book that was highly influential and and deserves to be uh, studied and and thought through in our contemporary times as well and his book was called an inquiry into the obligation of christians to use means for the conversion of the heathens <laughs> um, first part he looked at at matthew 28 the great commission which wasn't wasn't read that way as wasn't read as a as a command still um, uh, uh, valid for the contemporary church it was read as something that was only valid for the original apostles and william uh, carey showed that that no this was something that was supposed to be a hallmark of the life of the church hi there kitty um, the second part, he looked at the book of Acts as a, as a textbook for mission and showed how things like the Wesleyan revival um, uh, showed promise for, for, a, uh, a, for us ex to be able to expect God to do such things in, in yet other situations. Part three was maps and data. Part four was answering objections. And part five was a proposal for starting missionary agencies. And he was involved in founding the Paradigmatic Society, I suppose, the BMS, the Baptist <laughs> Missionary Society in 1792, first one. And with the principle of voluntarism and transdenominationalism. So you volunteered, you took, you knew, you knew what you were getting yourself into, in, in for, and you make, made a clear-eyed choice to be involved in mission. And they accepted people from any denomination who experienced a calling from God for, for such mission work. And what I love about, uh, well, I love many things about him, but he put his money where his mouth was you know he didn't just theorize about mission he actually uh, put himself in harm's way for the sake of mission and he and his family set off for india in 1793 sorry i'm trying to get this to toggle back to slides as usual i'm struggling right at first he 
kept body and soul together by managing an indigo factory in Midnapur. <laughs> and uh, it was very in, in a very short time he started translating the Bible from the original languages into Bengali. This is an uneducated cobbler, by the way. I think he had enormous intellectual gifts that had been suppressed by his uh, lack of access to to education. And I think that is very important for our day and age as well, where so many people do not have access to tertiary education or secondary education. In 1800, moved to Serampore. 1802, began the Sanskrit translation. These, the Bengali and Sanskrit that he was, was using were apparently not the best. They were sort of clunky and, and uh, plodding, but they were a basis for, for uh, local scholars to, to pick up the, the baton and, and build, improve, and, and get the Bible into local language uh, versions. He started a printing press where, where books for many languages were printed and there, w there wasn't a printing press. Uh, there weren't printing facilities when he started the, pr the press. He started the Serampore College, which gave the first Asian degrees, and in 1820 he started an a agricultural and horticultural college at, um, in Calcutta. Now, there are similarities and differences between uh, um, William Carey and George Schmidt. Uh, prayer rich strategy, yes. Self supporting, locally based missionary, yes. Um, he was more of a student of culture and language, though. And also, he, re he not only reached marginal <laughs> populations, but he also reached core populations or, or elite populations. He had a talent for macro organization, the establishment of, of colleges. And, and by and large, he, he had a reasoned presentation of the gospel, uh, was able to teach yeah, and introduce top-end technology and, and to introduce the, the um, uh, scholarship as scholarship. The Indian culture, of course, had a centuries, a millennia deep history of scholarship, but it what what William Carey opened up was was a way in, in which the in people from the Indian culture could interface at an intellectual level with people from the West, and he is regarded in India with with um, a lot of respect because of what he's what he had done. So there we are. Um, to interesting theorists. And we've got to ask ourselves, or maybe it would be helpful to ask ourselves, um, what sort of missionary would you be? If you could be a missionary to a new place, a new tribe, would you be more of a George Schmidt type missionary or more of a William Carey style missionary? I know that Leslie and, and, and I have been... Um, I guess more of the George Schmidt type, but I mean at the moment, if if uh, because of my life experiences, I perhaps be more of a William Carey type. Either way, I've got a lot of respect for both of them, and uh, there are lots of things to be learned positively from from their lives. Mm -hmm. Again, it's just <laughs> you could give to a whole series on on Carey and a whole series on the Moravians. Emerging from this, the Baptist Missionary Society, uh, there was a plethora of missionary agencies in the colonial mission era. AIM, AFM, CMS, the Cowley Fathers. I mean, this is alphabetical, by the way. I'm just reading off. In Swedish Imkulu Mission, London Missionary Society, Mission Aviation Fellowship. 
And I wonder why they're on that list. They weren't colonial era missionary agencies. Sorry, just take off AMF, MAF. Uh, I'll deal with them later. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mission Africa, the Nyasa Industrial Mission, the PEMS, uh, the Paris Evangelical Missionary Society, the Rhenish Richmond African Baptist. Uh, this is my favorite. The next one, Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts. <laughs> My goodness, SIM, Zambezi Industrial, Heart of Africa, Arab World Ministries, Algiers Mission Band. I think I've gone back to A again. <laughs> there were lots, lots and lots of people banding together, volunteers to, to, to um, be agents of the agency, but also agents of the kingdom in Africa. Bevins and Schroeder, with their sympathetic reading of mission history, say that while these missionaries were primarily shaped by their context, with their blind spots and superiority complexes, their general concern for indigenous peoples often provided a much-needed prophetic conscience to the colonial movement. That's from uh, Bevins and Schroeder's Constance in context, which is a very helpful book if you're interested in the subject. Now it's interesting, there was not a, you couldn't say that there was a great growth in Christianity during this period. It wouldn't be fair to say that that um, there was a, a great and noticeable uh, uh, increase in the number of Christians on the continent. But in the era after the uh, colonial, uh, the era of colonial mission, there was an incredible um, burst of energy, such a burst of energy that that it's in fact transformed the church scene in in Africa, and this was based on work that was begun by these intrepid missionaries. Um, let's have a look at some of the losses and gains. There's a loss here in Egypt, although they're both uh, in yellow. Uh, yellow on this map stands for 15 to 41 percent, and yellow here stands for 6 to 35 percent. But here's a, an increase in, in Sudan from from zero to um, six to thirty-five percent. That would be largely because of the recovery of contact with uh, Christian peoples here in the south of Sudan and the success of the of uh, the uh, Christianity coming back uh, really caught hold again in in South Sudan. Um, Ethiopia moving from 15 to 41 percent to 50 to 75 percent. I'm not sure of these figures now that I query them a bit. <laughs> I need to do some more re research. But I think that the, this area here that was about zero to 15 percent, by the year 2000, this has been transformed into the powerhouse of, of, um, of African Christianity, 75 to 95 percent, uh, Mozambique up to uh, 35 to 50 percent, um, uh, an astonishing growth of, of Christianization. Now, uh, I know that Christianization is not the same as, as faith in Jesus, I know that. But it does mean an openness, that there is an openness to um, uh, the gospel and, and some, of the, some of the barriers towards the communicating of, of the message of, of the kingdom of God are not there anymore. Now tomorrow I'm going to start with what I call an alphabet of African Christianity. I'm going to go through countries, starting with Algeria, uh, ending up with Zambia, I think. Um,
going to look at at just pick highlights from each each country of of the different sorts and shapes of mission that happened in the colonial era. And but for now, let's leave it at that. But let's pray. Father God, please help us to do the best we can with the gifts we have to bring about a situation in which people who have not yet been exposed to the possibility of faith in Jesus to, to find that possibility, to encounter that possibility of, of putting their faith in, in Christ having access to what we have access to. Amen. Okay, that's it for today and for yesterday, since I had to repeat the lecture. I will try not to erase it again today. But if this, if this is true and if this is helpful, maybe you can think of some ways of, of spreading this concept of of the 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 deep roots of christianity in africa to others you can have my slides if you like um, you'd have to do your own research in order to present uh, such lectures but you could i'm sure you could um, and after covid 19 has passed us by maybe you could invite discipling nations to run this or other courses at your church it, in order to help you to to work out how you as a church relate to the kingdom of God in Africa. Stay soapy, guys. <laughs>